Jedef Healthcare Stories. Carol Gill and Larry Voss are being interviewed in the living room of their home in Darien, Illinois. Their interviews are presented in six parts. This interview is part two. In the course of my recovery from the surgery, uh, it came a point where I needed to go from the regular hospital floor into a rehab unit so I could strengthen my muscles and rebuild you know, my body to a level that it was before months of laying in bed essentially and growing weaker. But in order to do that, you had to pass a certain test. And the test was a very standardized test for anybody wanting to go into rehab. A person with a disability, a person who was non-disabled, but needed to go into rehab. Uh, and that test was to be able to transfer, sit up, transfer into a chair, and, uh, and then back into bed, essentially. And when you could prove that you could do that, you were judged a viable candidate for rehab. Uh, I think that not looking at the individual and just making it a blanket test across the board could have particular consequences for a person with a disability. I knew what she expected of me. I knew how I did my transfers and I knew that that was going to be an impossible task for me to accomplish and yet the demand was placed on me if you can't do this then we're out of here and you're staying in this hospital bed. So I was forced to try and do something I knew I couldn't succeed at. Because I think she, her and, oh gosh, everything from her saying you have to do it or she will say you're not a viable rehab candidate Mm -hmm. her putting that pressure on you mm -hmm. and then her making you do a transfer over the arm of a chair where you would never do a transfer like that in your whole life right. and you ended up you couldn't do it so she said hang on to me and she swung you into the chair and you had seepage from your wound that was tripling after that yeah. because and you were in great pain and to this day we don't know if that caused internal damage mm -hmm. but she was so adamant because that was her protocol That's and if you still their protocol. yeah and if you couldn't do it then she was going to make you do it and if you couldn't do that you were not going to be allowed to go to rehab she would say that and she threatened you and then when she did get him into the chair she hid the control for the chair that would allow it to recline or go up and she told me now, I'll show you where it is, but don't tell him. And it was such a condescending, punitive um, approach or attitude to Larry that I was absolutely shocked that she would even think that I, as his wife, would like conspire against him with her. It was just so disrespectful. Mm -hmm. yeah, and it was really kind of stupid because who better than he would know if he couldn't tolerate sitting up in the chair. You know, he is the boss. And saying, oh, no, this is the way you have to do it. And I, that caused a, a, a setback in my recovery because I think that when I was trying to do that, I injured the surgical area and uh, it started the seepage, which delayed my recovery. When I worked in a rehab hospital a long time ago as a rehab psychologist, I encountered that attitude towards disabled people by hospital staff over and over. And I remember thinking, it's adversarial. They're adversarial. They're not only setting themselves up there as the expert to the disabled person down there, but they're assuming the disabled person is going to fight getting better. And it reminds me of what disability studies scholars have talked about when they've analyzed like television or movie portrayals of people with disabilities. And they talk about how there's frequently a setup in those movies where there's the disabled person and then a non-disabled person comes into their life and has to give them a little slap in the face to set them straight. And that's what I think a lot of health professionals think. 
what was disturbing for me as Larry's partner, as his, as his spouse, is that I saw this in horror. I knew she was damaging him. And I complained about it, and she was defended by all the other professionals, even though they didn't even see how detrimental her treatment was. They were just quick to defend her. And then I finally said, I want a change of physical therapist. And they said, well, you know, you, you, really, you really shouldn't do that. She's really pretty good. And then I demanded that she never go into its room again. So I was kind of escalating my response, my demands. And then one of the rehab doctors came to me and gave me a little talking to and said, my attitude is losing Larry support. <laughs> when I felt like my attitude maybe was saving his life, you know? So different perspectives are very much at play in these settings and I think that some health professionals, maybe especially therapists, I'm not sure, physical occupational therapists, I'm not sure. Most of them are wonderful, lovely people. I want to say that because it's absolutely true. But occasionally, there's the crusader who thinks she has to overcome the patient's viewpoints and resistances and impulses to set them straight. And I think that person's really dangerous. The bottom line is what we encountered was someone who didn't listen to Larry, or to me for that matter, about what his needs and limitations were. We had someone who felt she knew better than the person who lived with a disability for all these years. She um, didn't do her homework about what the requirements were for admission to this rehab unit he was going to. And furthermore, the, the um, transfer she made him do this is the part that I found the most absurd at all. It bore no resemblance to any transfer he would be asked to do in rehab or that he would ever do in real life because she was asking him to somehow surmount an arm of a chair between the bed and the seat. And that is just ridiculous because Larry did you know, sort of sliding transfers always. You take an arm off a wheelchair and you slide across. You go up to a toilet and you take the arm off the chair and you, you slide across. In a bed, you take down the rail so you could get across. But because she wanted him to get into a chair that had a fixed arm, she insisted that he surmount that arm. And I guess what amazed me in the whole process was I did respect her opinion that she might have suggestions she could make, but I felt she did not respect my experience at all. And so there was no communication going on. There were expectations placed by her and unrealistic demands placed on me that I knew I couldn't achieve. Healthcare stories made possible with generous support from the Manuel D. and Rhoda Mayerson Foundation. Carol Gill and Larry Voss were interviewed at their home in Darien, Illinois, July 2011. For more information, visit the Disability Rights Education and Defense Fund website, dreadf.org forward slash healthcare dash stories. This work is licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 3.0 Unported License.